Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. I have two guests. One has visited us before and the other one hasn't joined us that are going to be debating the topic of does preterism fail? Now, I want to give opening a definition so everybody kind of knows what is this thing you're calling preterism. And I'm going off of the, preter the preterism definition that you gave me, Don. Um, Don K. Preston here. Full preterism is the view that all Bible prophecies of the end of the age, coming of Christ, the judgment, the resurrection, the new creation were fulfilled by the time of and in the events of the end of the age, fall of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. I want to introduce our guest. I'm going to start with Don and uh, Don K. Preston. Married for 53 years, probably to his better half, Janice Preston, <laughs> two children, four grandchildren. He's the founder of president or founder and president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. He has three websites. I'm going to be adding those in the descriptions as we go uh, with this stream. www.eschatology.org www.bibleprophecy.com and www.donkpreston.com. He's the author of 34 books on preterist fulfilled es eschatology, which is the subject we're talking tonight. All you need to do is go to Amazon, type in Don, D-O-N, space K, Preston, and you will find all of his books on Amazon, and you can get them there or probably go to his websites as well. You can find them. Preston received the Doctor of Divinity degree from Vision International University of Romana, California in June of 2010, and he will be defending the notion that preterism has not fell tonight. With our other guest, we have Mark S. Smith, started his Christian walk in the Nazarene Church. Is it Mark S. Smith? Sorry, I'm probably Mark A. I'm sorry, I'm conflating you with the academic that I interviewed the oh. other day. I, my, my bro. Mark Smith started his Christian walk in the Nazarene church, then in his early teens migrated to the true church, the Church of Christ, non-instrumental. Two decades later, he left Christianity after an intense six-month study on the second coming led him to conclude that even if Jesus walked on water and rose from the dead, Mark couldn't worship a false prophet. Since then, Mark has written two books yet to be published, numerous articles and essays, and his own website, jcnotforme.com, where he practices his evangelical atheism. To pay the rent, he works as a mechanical engineer, a profession, unlike the ministry, that does not tolerate fantasy, wishful thinking, or figurative language. I appreciate both you gentlemen joining me today. The way we're going to have this structured is we're going to do a 30-minute opening, having Mark go first, then a 30-minute negative of that opening with Don, then a 10-minute rebuttal, allowing Mark 10 minutes, then Don 10 minutes. Then we'll be going to cross-examination. We'll start with Don. He'll be cross-examining Mark for 10. Then we'll allow Mark to cross-examine back for 10. Five-minute closing, starting with Mark. And then the final word will come from Don K. Preston with five minutes. Then we go to your Q&A. So if you have any questions, any critiques, anything at all, help us keep the lights on here at Myth Vision. We do appreciate all of the support we can get, whether it's negative, positive. The point is, as long as I ask that you be respectful at the end of the day, try to be respectful, ask honest questions, and that's all I'm asking for. Gentlemen, are you prepared to begin? Let's go. Let's do it. Awesome. Well, Mark, I'm going to start my timer. I'm going to mute my mic. I ask that the um, that your opposition mute during the presentation of whoever's giving their presentation, so we don't hear any grunts or moans in case you know <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> you know. Uh, that happens. Trust me, I've seen it. And um, I'm going to start my timer. We're going to go with 30 minutes. And then when we get close to the end of the 30, I'm not being rude. I'll put my finger up with one minute left. If you're in the middle of a sentence, I might go time, finish the sentence. That's the end of your session. And we'll move on to the next one. All right. All right. Are you ready for me to share your screen? Uh, let's do it. Time starting now. Does preterism fail? Yes, it does. It fails to save the Savior from his own false prophecies about returning within the first century. 
with convoluted, contorted, distorted, Gordian knots of theological goo, they claim all the second coming stuff happened in 70 AD, but nobody saw it, or did they? According to Don Preston, in 70 AD, they saw the second coming of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, the passing of heaven and earth, and the arrival of the new Jerusalem. But did they really see it? Preterist John Bray claims they saw it. The second coming, yes, they did. Not with the naked human eye, but with the eyes of understanding and perception. This was proof they saw it. Wow, invisible evidence. But how exactly did they see all this evidence? According to Preterist Don Preston, they saw it with the eyes of faith. Blessed are those who have not seen, but have believed. And that's the best they got, eyes of faith. But try showing a judge your invisible evidence the next time you're in court. It ain't going to fly. It really would be better to have photos to go with it. Here's a photo from 70 AD showing millions of dead people being resurrected worldwide. And here's the arrival of the new Jerusalem. Aren't those streets of gold just wonderful? And here, clearly visible to the eyes of faith, is the invisible Jesus with 10,000 trumpet blowing angels that no one heard. Now, if your eyes of faith maybe need a little help, Try these on for size. Sad preterist glasses. Anyway, the evidence for preterism is nothing more than make-believe wishful thinking. Nobody sees it, which is why I hope you can see that preterism fails. It fails for many reasons, such as convoluted, contorted, distorted word definitions. Preterists have no problem calling out others for doing what they themselves are masters of, putting words through a meat grinder. Here is Preterist J. Stuart Russell condemning futurists. Torture has been applied to these words to extort from them some other meaning than their obvious and natural one. And here's another example of the kettle calling the pot black. Non-preterist theologians won't accept the words of Jesus in their plain and obvious sense. Remember that, plain and obvious sense. The fact is, however, preterists themselves are allergic to doing this, and this self-blindness certainly earns them a certificate of hypocrisy. Why? because preterists are the biggest offenders when it comes to hypocrisy about words. Words such as, excuse me, words that support their theory, those words are literal. Words such as generation, a.k.a. genea, eminent, soon, quickly, at hand. These are taken at face value as being literal. However, Words that do not support their theory, those words are figurative. And there's a whole bunch of words and phrases that presto changeo become figurative in Predris La La Land. Take a few seconds to look these over. Preterists transform these from literal to figurative because it saves their savior from being a false prophet. But how do they do that? It's easy. They just click their heels together and say, whatever it takes, whatever saves the savior, truth be damned. And as long as you're making stuff up, how about this? King Kong. In 2005, because of too many gays in New Orleans, Bible God sent King Kong on a cloud to come in judgment against the city. And with his mighty breath named Katrina, King Kong blew it down. If you weren't 
special enough to see this, you need the eyes of faith. Another reason preterism fails is intellectual dishonesty. One example of this is how they handle a certain verse in 2 Peter. This is what it says. It will come the day of the Lord as a thief in the night in which the heavens with a rushing noise will pass away and the elements with burning heat be dissolved and the earth and the works in it shall be burnt up. Per preterism, all of this happened in 70 AD, but obviously it did not which leads to cognitive dissonance. To maintain their faith, this verse needed some tweaking. Tweaking by misquoting the dictionary. Preterist Max King, in his book, The Spirit of Prophecy, claims to be quoting Vine's dictionary definition of elements as used in 2 Peter. This is what he wrote. A thought for the literalists on the fiery destruction passage is the word elements, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. According to Vine, the word element in the scriptures means the rudimentary principles of religion. So per Max, it's not the universe that gets destroyed. It's some invisible principles. So problem solved. Or is it? Well, I happen to own a copy of this dictionary and decided to fact check Mr. King. That didn't turn out too good for him. As it turns out, the actual definition for element as used in 2 Peter is definition A. A, the substance of the material world, 2 Peter 3. In other words, according to Vines, the entire universe is due to be destroyed at the second coming. The elements themselves will dissolve and melt away, which did not happen in 70 AD. Now, here's the deception. Here's what Max quoted, claiming it was for 2 Peter. Definition C. Definition C. The rudimentary principles of religion. Colossians 2, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Mr. King pulled a fast one and deliberately swapped the definitions. But my question is this if preterism is so true, why does it need lies to support it? Maybe this is why. It requires lying because there's really nothing there. They have to generate lies to save their savior from his own false prophecies. But that's not all. There's also con games and the gish gallop. These tricks are used to support preterism. The goal being to confuse you and tie you up in knots. In fact, here's one of their favorite games, Twister. Twister the preterist word game that ties you up in knots. They deliberately set out to confuse and impress people, jumping all over the place in rapid fire, like someone ODing on too much Red Bull, spitting out claims they'll later pass off as facts. As one ex-preterist wrote, Preston is a master of minutia. This method of debating allows the debater to win simply by stringing together the most verses and overwhelming their opponent. This happens to be an old and dishonorable debate tactic known as the Gish Gallop. The Gish Gallop, a.k.a. dumping, or as Trump might put it, I can lie faster than you can fact check are attempts to make preterism look more solid than it actually is. In fact, it's nothing more than a rickety staircase. A rickety staircase leading nowhere, held in place with thoughts and prayers. From a distance, it looks impressive, but up close, it falls apart. And all those sticks, they want to bury you in an avalanche of verbiage. 
fire hosing you in a rapid bing, bang, boom. It's very similar to the three shell game, one of the oldest cons ever played. Their goal is confusion and deception, not truth. How do you beat the three shell game? You slow it down and look under the shells. That's what we're doing here. For example, Jesus claimed this gospel will be preached throughout the whole world. Then the end will come. Well, this obviously had not happened by 70 AD. So Preterists call in the big guns, the Apostle Paul who claimed of Christian missionaries back then that their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But there's still a problem. The fact that this fact is not a fact. No one in Japan or Australia heard the gospel back then. Paul lied. So how does a preterist get around this? the old bait and switch. And who better to do that than Gary DeMar and his book on preterism, Last Day's Madness. This is a book that overflows with gish gallops, assumptions masquerading as facts, the three shell games. For example, let's see what he did to fix Paul's lie. From his book, we read, the word translated world in many translations is the Greek word okomini, the inhabited earth. The prophecy clearly shows that the gospel would be preached throughout the Roman Empire before Jesus re would return. Did you catch the switcheroo here? The inhabited earth magically shrunk down to just the Roman Empire with no explanation. He changed the impossible preaching to the entire world into the possible bait and switch, the three shell game. But these kind of word games lead to a legitimate question. If preterism is so true and correct, why are lies and tricks needed to support it? In DeMar's book, I counted over 34 places where he pulled similar con games. Preterism fails because it requires dishonesty. It also fails because of jigsaw puzzle pieces that just won't fit. Preterists try to assemble the various pieces of the predicted second coming into a coherent jigsaw puzzle, but they fail. The problem with the Preterist jigsaw puzzle is there are some pieces of information that just won't fit, no matter how hard they try to jam them in. Of course, they could always claim they've already fit the stubborn pieces in, but they're invisible. Which reminds me, never invite a preterist to a church picnic. You'll be disappointed, trust me. But back to our jigsaw puzzle. Here's one of the pieces that just won't fit. Take a few seconds to look this over. As you can see, half of the New Testament was for non-Jews, ex-pagans, folks completely ignorant of the Old Testament. So I don't care what even a billion Old Testament verses might say. It's irrelevant to the second coming argument. Fact is, you shouldn't need a doctorate of divinity to figure this all out, even if it is from the prestigious Vision International University of Ramona, California, shown here in all its glory. 
maybe Don could use his doctorate of divinity powers to explain things like Paul's advice against getting married. Advice such as, it is good in view of the present distress for a man to remain as he is, i.e. single if already single. Do not seek a wife. The form of this world is passing away. And concerning this, Don Preston writes, Paul was assuredly counseling celibacy as a direct result of the present distress. Here's the problem. Putting off weddings in the Greek city of Corinth because of the present distress makes no sense if the present distress is 100% limited to Jerusalem, as the preterists teach. And remember, Jerusalem is 836 miles away from Corinth, further than Chicago is from New York. Nothing that impacted only Jerusalem would have affected Corinth. This piece of their second coming puzzle does not fit. For if preterism were true, there is no logical reason to forbid Greek marriages in Corinth. Another piece that doesn't fit their puzzle is Thessalonica, another Greek city where the Greek Christians were originally persecuted by Jews, but later on by their pagan neighbors. As Paul says, you also endured sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen. Their fellow Greek Gentile neighbors, not Jews, had been persecuting them at that time. So Paul promised revenge on these pagan Greek neighbors when Preterist Jesus returned in 70 AD. It is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, i.e. their pagan neighbors. When Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, dealing out retribution. The problem is, nothing happened in Thessalonica in 70 AD that made the history books. No fire from heaven, no retribution, nothing. Fact is, Bible God could have nuked a million Jews in Jerusalem. It would have had zero impact on pagan Greeks 916 miles away. Here's some more things that don't fit their puzzle. Things promised but never delivered. Some things were promised for 70 AD, according to preterism, but were never delivered. Things like new bodies. We shall be given new bodies when the last trumpet is blown. We who are still alive shall suddenly have new bodies heavenly bodies that cannot perish, but will live forever. New bodies he has promised us, bodies that will never be sick again and will never die. <clears throat> if preterism was true and all this happened in 70 AD, some body would have noticed these bodies, but they didn't because it never happened. And here's more malarkey. In 70 AD, per preterism, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. If preterism was true, the entire Roman Empire in 70 AD would have eyewitnessed all Christians being vacuumed up, up, and away to never, never land, but they didn't because it never happened. And here's another problem for Predris. If this had happened and all Christians were removed from the earth, then so too Christianity. But it did not disappear. And it continued, and its continued existence disproves Predrism. Here's something else that never happened in 70 AD. A time of tribulation such has not occurred since the beginning of the creation until now and never shall. This also never happened. No one in the entire world, Romans or Greeks or Chinese, noticed it. 
this malarkey of preterism fails to match with reality. And here's another example of malarkey. Paul, speaking of the second coming, predicted there is about to be a rising again of the dead, both of righteous and the unrighteous. This massive worldwide resurrection of all dead people happened in 70 AD, according to Preterus, but it didn't happen. Even China has no written records of this zombie invasion. And for Preterism to claim it did happen, but was invisible, undetectable, unnoticeable, is a joke. And for those who claim these things were limited to the Jews and then only spiritually perceived with the eyes of faith, Paul wouldn't have wasted his time warning pagans such as Felix or idol-worshiping Greek philosophers in Athens about a any day now zombie invasion and judgment day. If these were just for the Jews, it'd be like Darth Vader threatening the Greeks to change, or he'd blow up the planet Aldebaran. Now, what about history? It doesn't help preterism either. No ancient historians of that era took note of any of the specific worldwide things we just covered. No mention of Judgment Day, millions of zombies, nor flying Christians. The only one to come close is Josephus, who claimed a cow gave birth to a lamb and that some reported seeing soldiers running among the clouds. Of course, this doesn't help the Predress at all because their cloud riders are all invisible. Predrism also fails to account for the existence of the early church fathers. If Jesus kidnapped all Christians off the planet in 70 AD, thereby gutting and destroying Christianity. And here's more puzzle pieces that don't fit. False prophecies, even if preterism is true. Preterism, even if it was true, still does not save the Savior from his own false prophecies. For example, and while some were talking about the temple, he said, as for these things which you are observing, the days will come when there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. Per Jesus, these things, plural, which would include the Temple Mount, which you are observing, which also would include the Temple Mount, not one stone will be left upon another. But as you can see from all the stones, this prophecy remains unfulfilled, which means if the Jesus of Preterism actually returned in 70 AD, these stones prove him a false prophet. As this prophecy of his remains unfulfilled, and there's even more problem for the Preterists. 33 AD, Jesus to Caiaphas, you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. 46 AD, Caiaphas dies. 70 AD, Preterist Jesus returns. Caiaphas doesn't see it. Preterist Jesus equals a false prophet. Both Orthodox and Preterist Jesus screwed this one up. By either perspective, Jesus proved himself a false prophet. Caiaphas seeing Jesus' return never happened. Other things also didn't happen in 70 AD, such as the kings of the earth and every slave and free person hid themselves in cave. Every single free person in the entire world was hiding in a cave. This did not happen fail. A third of the earth was burnt up. A third of the ships were destroyed. This also did not happen. Fail. A third of mankind was killed. 
This as well never happened. Fail. Every living thing in the sea died. Never happened. Fail. Fail. None of these happened in 70 AD. Preterism fails and fails and fails. And it also fails to acknowledge that the Bible clearly promises a visible second coming. In fact, per the Bible, it will be the most visible event in the history of mankind. As John Preston writes, Jehovah had ridden on the clouds many times in the Old Testament and was perceived but not visible. Jehovah came on the clouds many times but was never visibly seen. Of course, the real reason Jehovah is never seen can be answered by any 10-year-old atheist. He doesn't exist. None of them do. But back to preterism. They claim that in 70 AD, Jesus returned invisibly as Christ was not supposed to come bodily and visibly. Many believers think that his return must be visible. But where? Where does the scripture say that Jesus' return must be visible? Where? Where does it say he'll be visible? Well, I don't know. Maybe here. As lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Everyone will see him clearly, seen by everyone seen everywhere. He will be seen by everyone. Seen by everyone except preterists. But there's more. Watch, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Watch, 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 watch. By his appearing, the appearing of Jesus Christ, the reappearing of Jesus Christ, people are told to watch for things they can see. And reappear means he'll be as visible the second time as he was the first. But there's still more. Every eye will see him. Predris, what part of every eye do you not understand? Instead of trying to explain this away, why not follow your own damn advice? and accept the words of Jesus in their plain and obvious sense. As one Predros author advised, stop trying to explain this away. This isn't rocket science. The second coming is predicted to be visible, and the ascension story in Acts chapter 1 locks it in. Where Luke writes to the non-Jewish ex-pagan Theophilus that, when he, Jesus, had beheld these things, while they beheld with their eyeballs, he was taken up and a cloud, a visible cloud, received him out of their sight, their visible eyeball sight. And while they looked, looked with their fleshly eyeballs, steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, with their eyes they saw the direction he was going. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, visible angels in visible robes of a visible color. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Gazing with what? Eyeballs. At what? Something visible. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go. The like manner is the visibility of it, without doubt or quibble. However he returns, it is promised to be as visible and seen as the going was. And this did not happen in 70 AD, Preterist Second Coming. So having weighed all the evidence, we can answer the following question. Does preterism fail? Yes, and big time. Their arguments melt away like snowflakes in a warm hand, turning out to be nothing but convoluted explanation. Time. Sexual cotton candy. 
they failed to reach their goal, which is to save the Savior from his own false prophecy. Does it fail? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate the presentation. And now we're turning to Don K. Preston for 30 minutes. Don, I'm going to start my timer. When you say go, I'm hitting it. And do you, oh, you're muted. You're muted, sir. Hold on. Let me make sure you're unmuted. There you are. There you are. You're unmuted. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't get my stopwatch to work at all. So, uh, and I just dropped my mouse. Uh, uh oh. Well, I have your, just so you know, I'll keep track of time and make yeah. sure that 30 minutes and then I'll give you the finger, not the middle one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll uh, let you know after the 60 seconds and just butt in and say time and then let you finish your sentence. But um, let me know when you're ready and I'll hit, I'll hit uh, the timer. All right. Let and me I'll go. Mute you, Mark, that way there's no accidental communication. Oh, he is muted. Okay. Uh, can you see my... Um... Can you see my PowerPoint? No, sir. Can you share it at the bottom? Do you see the present button? Where do I find that? On the StreamYard um, at the bottom, there's a little plus symbol in a screen, and it says present. Present. Hit that, and then hit share. Share the screen. Yep, hit share screen, then click window. Um, screen sharing is easiest with two monitors. Screen sharing works best on a good computer. <laughs> um, share the screen. We'll do it like that. Select the window or screen. Huh. Where did it go? Select window or screen. It's not. Um, that's not the one I want at all. Huh. Well, I apologize for this. Did you uh, want to send it to me? Because if you email it to me, I can open it for you. Uh, I tell you what I will do. Uh, I'm not going to use the entire presentation of this particular uh, one. Okay. Uh, I will use the charts that I want to use, and then I will return to the page where I will show up. Uh, so you're not wanting it to be on the screen? So it says my browser has blocked my screen. It may be you're not in Google Chrome. I am not. That's I am in why. Fox. I okay, that's in, why. That's why. Okay. Okay, well, I apologize for that. I should have gotten together with you on this. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Did you want to send me it, and I can open it for you? Um, that way I, I, you hit next and I can just press next for you. But no, that's all right. Because like I said, I'm not even sure exactly how many of, of the charts I'm going to use from this particular PowerPoint. Okay. Um, you know, I've got several headings and so I'll just use the ones that I want and then I'll come back to, to the screen with me on it. So, uh, and this will take the 30 minutes by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I'll start your timer when you say go. Go. All right. I'm going to mute. Go ahead, sir. All right. To engage in this discussion, I've been looking forward to it very, very much. The, the, one of the main points, one of the key points that Mark made repeatedly uh, during the at least the second half of his entire presentation, that the idea of an invisible parousia, invisible coming of the Lord, is just ridiculous. Because after all, the Bible uses the term, you will see uh, like manner uh, going uh, and coming of God to be the same nature, Acts chapter 1. Uh, the Bible talks about every eye seeing him, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. And so over and over, Mark assures us that the concept of Christ coming invisibly, not being seen with the visible eye, is absolutely ludicrous. It's really unfortunate that Mark has such a lack of understanding of Hebraic thought and apocalyptic language and the very nature of apocalyptic language. Let me give just a little, a few examples from history, and then I'll move in to scripture. Josephus tells us that at Mount Sinai, lightnings and thunder, quote, declared God to be there present, his parousia. 
The miraculous manifestation in the tabernacle showed the presence, parousia, of God. And by showing Elisha's servant the encircling chariots that nobody could see except Elisha, God made manifest his servant, or to his servant, his power and presence, or parousia, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, 7, 15 through 17. So, the idea is known in Josephus about God not being visible to every single eye on earth. And let me just make this very, very quick statement. It's really lamentable uh, that Mark imposes a modern cosmology onto the ancient text. He scoffs at the idea that the gospel was preached into all of the world because after all, nobody in China, nobody in Japan, nobody in Australia uh, heard that gospel. Well, guess what? As Gary DeMar pointed out, and as most Bible scholars understand, the Greek word oikomene does refer to the known Roman world at the time. It wasn't referring to the globe. And so that's a, that's a completely inappropriate application of a modern cosmology to the ancient text. But let me continue. When the Roman official Petronius tried to appease the Jews, Josephus, Josephus claimed that God did show his presence. Now, this is a, an extremely, extremely stressful time in Israel's history. And so Petronius was trying to appease them. And Josephus claimed that, quote, God did show his presence, his parousia, to Petronius. Well, how did he do that? Did he come out of heaven as Mark would demand that he would by, by the use of the word parousia? No, no. Josephus says God made known his parousia by sending rain. And we have all sorts of references of the word parousia by Josephus, who was a first century contemporary of Paul, and thus using the Greek word parousia in similar ways as Paul would. And parousia meant an ongoing, even invisible presence. We have many examples of this throughout the, throughout the scriptures. For, and history, such as Josephus. Then we have 2 Maccabees chapter 8, 21 to 24. And this is fascinating. This is the story of Judas beating Nicanor, the, uh, the, uh, sold, the general of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, and the army of Ptolemy and Antiochus Epiphanes. Nicanor had 20,000 troops. Judas had 6,000. Judas had Eleazar, the priest, read from the scripture before the battle, and he urged the soldiers with these words, quote, Judas's words encouraged his men and made them willing to die for their religion and their country. He then divided his army into four divisions, 22 of about 1,500 men, men each, with himself, his brothers, Simon, Joseph, and Jonathan, each in charge of a division. And after ordering Eleazar to read aloud from the holy book, he gave his men the battle cry. Now, listen very carefully. God will help us and personally lead the attack against Nicanor. Now, do you suppose that Judas really honestly thought that God was going to visibly come out of heaven and go in front of the army? No, he was using well-known Jewish apocalyptic metaphoric language that was never intended to be taken, as Mark does, in some woodenly literalistic uh, way. And then... Notice what Paul says about God in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever, 1 Timothy 1 verse 17. And watch this. Before his incarnation, Jesus was in the form of God. He was invisible just like the Father. Then Jesus prayed that upon his ascension, he would be restored to that former glory. John chapter 17. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So upon returning to the Father, Jesus would come as the Father had come to be revealed as King of kings and Lord of lords, not as a five foot five Jewish man like Mark Smith demands. Well, let's go on just a little bit. Mark called attention to my book, Like Father, Like Son. Jesus said, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will reward each man according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there's some standing here which shall not taste of death 
until they see the son, son of man coming in his kingdom. Now, one of the very few things that Mark and I would agree on is that Jesus was predicting his coming in that generation. Well, Jesus said his coming was to be in the glory of the Father. There is a broad consensus of scholarship in that Jesus was saying he was going to come in the same manner as the Father had come. Now, all Mark could do really is to scoff at the idea that God had ever come. But the fact is, Scripture affirms that God had come many times, many, many times. He had, as a matter of fact, come on the clouds. He had come with a shout. He had come in flaming fire. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 22. David spoke the words to the Lord, the words of this song, on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies, from the hand of Saul. So Saul is chasing David all around the countryside to kill him. David prayed to the Lord for deliverance. And he said, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and I cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. <laughs> Here we go. Then the earth shook and trembled. No record of that literally happening. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken. No record of that literally happening. Smoke went up from his nostrils. Wait a minute. He's the invisible God. You don't see smoke coming out of the nostrils of an invisible God and devouring fire from his mouth. You don't see fire coming out of the mouth of an invisible God. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also. Now watch this. Nobody saw the literal physical heavens bowed down, but David said it had happened in the past. This is Jewish Hebraic apocalyptic language that Mark seems to be ignorant of either willingly or unwillingly. He bowed the heavens also. Now watch this. He came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub. That's an angel. He came with the angel. Nobody saw angels and he flew. Now Mark says God was never, ever, ever seen coming. Well, David said he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness, canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds. So every single thing that Mark denied had ever happened, the Bible affirms it had happened. Now, very quickly, let me jump forward to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah is giving a prophecy of the last days, the time of Jesus, and he says, oh, that you would rend the heavens. Isaiah is wanting God to tear the heavens up, destroy the earth. Literally, physically, no. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. This is Isaiah 64, 1 to 3. Oh, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence as fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. That's from the in the Septuagint, that's from the Greek word prosopon, which is directly related to parousia. It means presence. It literally means face or nose. Now watch Isaiah as he continues. When you did, past tense, now remember, he's asking God to come and do awesome things. Now he's saying he wants him to come as he had come in the past because when you did awesome things, for which we did not look, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. So here is Isaiah and Israel wanting Yahweh to come as he had come in the past. This is a prayer for the second coming. But wait a minute. Isaiah and Israel is wanting the Messiah to come as the father had come and yet the father, although he had come many times in the past, he had never come visibly or bodily. He used one nation to judge another nation. And this is the very truth that is taught by covenant eschatology. Now, look at very quickly, look at Matthew 24 and verse 30. Jesus said, then the son of the son of man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Mark says, you had to see literally, visibly with the eyes. Mark says, you cannot see what is not visible. Well, wait a minute. God, the invisible God, had come many times in the Old Testament and had been seen. 
Is that a contradiction? No, it's metaphoric language. Now, Jesus said they will see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That doesn't mean that there would be a literal, visible sign, you know, Jesus on riding on a cumulus cloud, as Mark tries to interpret Acts chapter 1. The meaning of the Greek there is that what they would see in the events of the fall of Jerusalem, the visible events of the fall of Jerusalem was to be the sign that Jesus was enthroned in the heavens as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, acting in the very same manner as his father had acted many times before. How, how had his father acted many times before? Oh, he came out of heaven with fire, with a shout. He destroyed heaven and earth. He was seen, but none of it ever literally, visibly happened. So to reiterate, the fall of Jerusalem was the visible sign of the re invisible reality that Christ was enthroned and was happening. He was coming. Finally, a whole lot more I could give on this, but nonetheless, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, well, the kingdom of God would come with the parousia, the coming of the Lord. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one. I charge you therefore before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his kingdom and coming. Mark alluded to that passage a while ago. Okay, thank you very much. Kingdom and parousia goes hand in heaven, hand in hand. The Jews, the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God was going to come. He said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here, see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, folks, look. The Jews, just like Mark, had the same literalistic, woodenly literalistic concept of the coming of the kingdom. And Jesus categorically rejected that expectation. So here's a syllogism. The kingdom comes at the parousia. The kingdom does not come with observation. Therefore, the parousia was not to come with observation. Now, let me, uh, let me go back and hit some of the specific arguments that Mark made. And I specifically want to touch very, very quickly here on Matthew 26, 64. He said, boy, this is a massive failure of preterism. Jesus is, is in front of the Sanhedrin. Jesus says to the Sanhedrin, and Mark focuses on Caiaphas, and he had a really nice chart there. I loved a lot of your charts, by the way, Mark. Good stuff. <laughs> I don't agree with them, but they're pretty. So anyway, Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power of great glory. That's a direct allusion back to Daniel chapter 7. And Mark says, ah, preterism failed, and Jesus lied because Caiaphas died. And yeah, in 1990, they found his ossuary. We know when he died. Yeah. So Mark says, see, Jesus lied because Caiaphas died way before AD 70. Well, here's the problem. This is not very careful research on Mark's part. The Greek of the text of Matthew 26, 64 is in the second person plural. Jesus was not addressing Caiaphas specifically, an individual. He was addressing the entire Sanhedrin, saying some of them, he didn't single out which ones. He said, you as a body will see me coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What kind of language is he using? Oh, that's the Old Testament language that we have already established as metaphoric. Then Mark says, oh, look, Jesus said, do you not see all these things? There's not one stone shall be left standing on top of another. Well, once again, this betrays a lack of research. Jesus was talking about the temple proper. The west wall was the retaining wall of the temple, of the temple mount. It was not the temple itself. And so Mark is trying to be overly literalistic in his application of the prophecy of Jesus. When Jesus wasn't pointing to the outer wall, he was speaking of the temple. Now watch. Mark then says, well, you know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we shall all meet him in the air. Therefore, <coughs> pardon me, 
There should not have been any Christians left. Well, if Mark would have read my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings, Mark would have seen that the Greek word apontesis that is used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 doesn't mean to come and get and take away. It carried with it, and by the way, this I document this extremely heavily. I have probably what is one of the most in-depth linguistic studies of apontesis to be found anywhere in this book. We shall meet him in the air. This is a, a technical term that was used in the first century. It's used by Josephus. <coughs> Pardon me. It's used by a host of Roman historians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The meaning of apontesis was a dignitary was coming to visit a city. Here's the city. Dignitary was coming like this. The leaders of the city would go out to meet him and escort him back to the city. There, he would dwell with them. And guess what? The whole idea is based upon the restoration of the fellowship that was lost in Adam. Heaven and earth were alienated through the sin of Adam. What Jesus was going to come to do as Ephesians chapter 1, 10 and following, teaches so very clearly, was to restore the fellowship between heaven and earth. It wasn't to remove, <clears throat> pardon me, the purpose of Christ's coming was simply not, as Alpontesis proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, thus completely falsifying Mark's entire argument about the removal of the church from the earth, and therefore, how do we even have any early church writers? <clears throat> how, do, how do we have? Uh, Barnabas or uh, Clement or any of the other church writers. Why weren't they raptured? Because that's not the promise. That is a total misunderstanding of what Paul was teaching. Paul was teaching that Christ was going to restore fellowship between heaven and earth. And as a result of that, he now dwells in us and we in him. Now, <clears throat> Mark says we have absolutely no record of the gospel being preached in China or being seen, Jesus being seen in China. Well, once again, that's an abuse of oikumene. That's an abuse of how it was used in the first century. The, the New Testament writers, Romans included, did not use oikumene to speak of China. They didn't know about China, probably. I mean, there may be some question about that, but the point of fact is that was not in the Roman Empire that was not considered as the world. And so that's a misuse of the language. And then he says, Mark says, the great tribulation simply did not ha happen. Well, once again, that is a failure to understand the metaphoric and the hyperbolic nature of the language. Jesus said, then shall be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world, nor ever, shall, ever yet, until now, nor ever yet shall be. Well, you see, in the Old Testament, that kind of language was used of the plagues of Egypt in Exodus chapter 8. That kind of language is used to speak in a positive way of kings. Oh, he was the best king there ever was. There was never another king like him before or after. And then later they talk of another king and say, oh, see, there's never been a, there'll never be another one, never has been one like him, never will be another one like him. My precious wife just brought me some water. <laughs> okay, to go on. And then he makes a, a massive mistake by claiming that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that it was pagan persecutors, that it wasn't the Jews. Now, I don't know where he got that, to be honest. I mean, I know what the argument is, but it's not based on the text. Paul established the church in the synagogue. What's the synagogue? It's where the Jews met. When some of the unbelieving Jews did not accept what Paul said, what did they do? They went into the marketplace and stirred up some of the unsavory fellows, and they persecuted the church. Now, what that at the most that that could mean, at the absolute most that could mean, is that you had both Jews and Gentiles. But here's the question. Who was instigating it? It wasn't the pagans. They were probably being paid money by the Jews to persecute. And Mark tries to make it a deal of the fact that he says, well, they were their countrymen. Well, let's see. 
did the Jews who lived in Thessalonica, who attended the uh, who attended the synagogue, were they not the fellow countrymen of the Thessalonian Christians who were converted out of the synagogue along with many of the leading women and Greeks as well? I'm not denying that there was a pagan element of the church. I'm simply pointing out it's totally inappropriate. It's totally unjustified to say, oh, they, they were there were no Jewish persecutors involved here. Evidence simply does not support it. And then he goes first Corinthians chapter seven, as well as second Thessalonians chapter one. And he says, well, Paul forbade marriage. Well, in the first place, he didn't forbid it. He just simply said, it is good. That's not a prohibition, but he said it is good for the present distress not to be married. And he scoffs and he says, what in the world would the destruction of Jerusalem 800 miles away have to do with the present distress in Corinth? Same thing in Thessalonica, 900 miles away. Well, here's what Mark is clearly overlooking again willfully or otherwise. In Alexandria, Egypt, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, in 66 AD, time of the beginning of the Jewish war. And by the way, Mark mischaracterized preterists in saying, preterists say that the, that the uh, war, the Jewish war was strictly in Jerusalem and Judea. I don't teach that. So I don't know where Mark got that, but that's a mis misrepresentation. Anyway, in AD 66, in Alexandria, Egypt, hundreds upon hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem and Judea, guess what happened? 50,000 Jews were killed in one day by the Greeks. You trying to tell me that the Jewish war didn't have any impact outside of Judea? And by the way, there are many other cities that Josephus names in which pagans rose up because they knew the troubles in Jerusalem. They used it as, a, as an excuse for insurrection, and they killed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Jews in these pagan cities. It is therefore entirely inappropriate. It is historically inaccurate uh, to say, well, you know, the Jewish war was strictly localized in Jerusalem, and people outside of Judea would never have cared anything about it. Well, what about the Jews who were dying by the thousands? And by the way, in Luke chapter 21, 25 to 26, Jesus said, during that time of the Jewish war, distress would be coming on all the nations. Not just one, all the nations. And anyone who has read Tacitus, Suetonius, Dio Cassius, and Josephus knows that even that first century period of time was a period of one constant insurrection, one constant civil war. In my own research, I've documented at least 45 different warfares, insurrections and civil wars that took place uh, in the first century. Now, uh, let's talk about 2 Peter chapter 3 and the Greek word stoikia. He says Max King lied. No, he didn't. Max King gave one of the legitimate definitions of the Greek word stoichia that are given by Vine's Theological Dictionary. I've got a copy of it sitting right over there, so I know exactly what it says. Stoichia is first elements. It can be a reference to earth, wind, fire, and water, physical elements. It can also mean to an order of soldiers in, in progression, or as Vine's Theological Dictionary says, item number C, it can refer to the elementary or rudimentary doctrines of anyone. Now, here's what's fascinating. Second Peter chapter three, Paul said, or excuse me, Peter, in describing the coming, quote, destruction of the earth and the elements therein, said he was teaching the same identical thing that Paul did in all of his epistles, concerning the day of the Lord and the destruction of the elements. Well, here's something fascinating, and I point this out. In my book, I have an in-depth uh, linguistic study of stoichia, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So here is Peter. 
Peter says, I'm teaching the same thing about the destruction of the elements that Paul did in his epistles. Paul used the Greek word stoichia some seven or eight times in all of his letters. He used it in Colossians, particularly. And he said that the Colossians had died to the element stoichia of the world. Now, was Paul saying that the Colossians had died to physical creation? Had they died to earth, wind, fire, and water? Paul was no, was no Gnostic. Paul knew exactly what he was talking about. What kind of elements was he talking about? He was The elements that he was talking about is <clears throat> let no man judge you in respect of new moon, feast days, and Sabbaths. Don't be subject to touch not, taste not, handle not. Those are basic doctrines of the old covenant law. Those are the elements of the law. And thus, for Mark to say, oh, story Kia can only mean physical elements. I'm sorry, that is simply linguistically false. It is doctrinally false. And then, let me see here. Um, he says that preterism fails to save Jesus from his failed prophecies. Preston says they saw it, but not with the eye. Well, that's exactly what I've proven in my PowerPoint presentation that I read from. Jesus said he was going to come as the Father had come. He said he was going to come in the kingdom. The kingdom does not come with observation. He said, Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we don't look at the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. What's he talking about in that text? Resurrection. So here's Paul saying, we're not looking for the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. Yet Mark says, no, 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 they had to see it. Well, how could they see it if they didn't see it? Well, Isaiah 26 tells us, Lord, when your judgments are in the earth, the righteous will learn wisdom. But the wicked will see, but they will not see. And the resurrection is the subject of the text. And here's Isaiah saying, when the Lord was acting in resurrection, the righteous would understand what was going on. The wicked would see, see the same identical events and go, I don't get it. I don't get it. What's going on? Until finally they would see because it would be too late and they would perish in judgment. That's Isaiah chapter 26, 8 and following. And so when Mark emphasizes absolute, literal, physical, woodenly, literalistic seeing, he is not ac acknowledging Hebraic apocalyptic language that is invariably metaphoric, hyperbolic, non-literal. And I could give passage after passage that describes the past destruction of, quote, heaven and earth. Isaiah 13, Isaiah 24, Isaiah 34. We could look at them in depth if we, if we had the time, but we don't. So when Jesus said he was going to come as the Father had come, and we see in the Old Testament repeatedly the Father had come, the invisible God had come many, many times with fire, the flames, the shout, the earth shook, but none of it literally happened. The father had come out of heaven, walked on the mountains. He was seen, yet not visibly seen. And Jesus said that was going to be the nature of his parousia. And thus, Mark's entire first affirmative falls in light of what the Bible exa precisely says. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. Thank you both, gentlemen, for ri sticking rigorously to your 30 minutes. Now that was hard. <laughs> Yeah, I can see you guys are uh, definitely digging in here. Uh, Mark's going to be doing a 10-minute rebuttal, and then we're going to have Don do 10 minutes. And then after that, we're going to be getting to a 10-minute cross-examination. We'll let Don attack you first. I'm going to use the word attack here. We're, we're in a battle. <laughs> um, so before, you're going to forget all that, so we'll just play it one step at a time. Mark, you have 10 minutes. Let me know. Are You, you don't need slides, do you? Um, I'll let you know if, if I do. Okay. Okay. So you want me to hit start? Uh, no. No, let, let, let me just go through with the, the verbal stuff first. Uh, first no, I of mean, all, do you want me to go ahead and start the time? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Nope, you're fine. Ready, set, go. Yeah, let me uh, start my time too. Da, 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 da. Hold on. Okay. 
Uh, first of all, the reason I pointed out that half, over half of the New Testament was written to non-Jews is because I know from reading several of Don's books that he is completely immersed in the Old Testament Jewish theology. Uh, totally irrelevant to the topic of the second coming. I'm not even going to bother responding to his constant Old Testament, Isaiah, Jewish, Hebraic, apocalyptic language, blah, blah, blah. Isaiah, Saul chasing David. Jewish apocalyptic language, Second Maccabees, army divided, Elijah could see the chariots, etc., etc., etc. It doesn't matter. Most of the people that the New Testament was written to were pagans. They weren't Jews. They were raised as pagans, and probably a lot of them couldn't even read. They would have taken the words of Jesus and Paul at face value, in their plain and obvious sense, as your own preterist author, J. Stuart Russell, pleaded for. Instead, we got Don meandering about metaphoric language, apocalyptic language. Uh, what else we got here? Hebraic, apocalyptic language, hyperbolic. I mean, all this what happened to the advice that your own preterist author gave the rest of us? Take Jesus in the plain and obvious sense that he spoke these words. You don't need to get all technical and Old Testament with this stuff. Except, of course, when figurative language suits your arguments, that's when you bring this stuff in. When literal language suits your argument, such as the word milo uh, in the Greek, you definitely bash people over the head with that, the futurists. Why aren't you people taking this word seriously? Uh, yeah, you guys are hypocrites. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, on to specific points. Uh, the ascension of Jesus, I noticed... Uh, Basically, he skipped over that. If I, I would like to ask Don a question, but it's just a hypothetical question. I don't want him to answer it. How could the author of Acts, Dr. Luke, had made it any more clear that the return of Jesus was going to be visible? I don't know how he, how he possibly could have specified it to make it even more obvious that the expected, anticipated second coming of Jesus was to be as visible as his ascension. You skipped over that. You really did. And in your books, I kept waiting for you to deal with Acts chapter 1. You skip over it, and for good reason. You have no answer for it. You, kept, you keep in your books talking about, well, the bodily... Jesus lost his body when he went to heaven. Therefore, he'd be invisible. Nobody could see him. Uh, excuse me. Your God is unable to make spirits visible. Your God has to have things in a body for them to be visible. There are plenty of things that don't have bodies that are visible. Uh, tornadoes, trees, uh, water. Uh, for you to cop out, and say, well, because Jesus lost his earthly body, he would come back invisibly. That's a bunch of malarkey. I'm, I'm sorry. And Acts chapter 1 is the death knell of the invisible Jesus that you guys claim uh, returned in 70 AD. Uh, as for, uh, let's see what else here. As for Caiaphas, yes, I know the word you is plural, but Caiaphas is the one who had just talked to Jesus. So when Jesus said, you will see, obviously that included Caiaphas and it included other people in the room, you, etc. For Caiaphas to have died before that happened is a clear false prophecy. Caiaphas would have been 99% of that you. The other people in the room would be peripheral. Learn your Greek, sir. Thank you very much. 
uh, as far as Jesus and the temple, Jesus said very clearly, the things you have been looking at, you cannot look at the temple back then without seeing the temple mount. Try building a temple without a foundation. It's impossible. The foundation is part and parcel of every building on the face of this earth. For you guys to claim that, well, the temple doesn't include the foundation, that's ridiculous. I'm an engineer. I know that much. Without a foundation, you have no building. The stones that the apostles were looking at, a lot of them are still there, and that proves Jesus a false prophet. You can't just willy-nilly say, well, it's only the temple. But no, the foundation is part of the building. As far as the rapture, that no Christians will be left behind, what I said, et cetera, et cetera. You said it wasn't the removal of the Christians. Sorry, but taking the words of Paul in the plain and obvious sense, as you preterists demand we do, uh, yeah, these people would have been caught up in the air and taken off the earth. That's the plain and obvious sense of the language. You don't have to get into a bunch of Old Testament nooks and crannies and try to obfuscate and confuse the issue, which is exactly what you were doing in the Old Testament. You're like an octopus that squirts ink out, hoping to obscure and make confusing what is very plain and simple to see. The ex-pagan Christians who were reading this would have taken it at face value that, okay, we're gonna be caught up in the air and we're going to get new bodies, and there's going to be a worldwide uh, massive tribulation, a resurrection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They would have taken all of these things at face value, just like J. Stuart Russell demanded. Uh, the only reason the preterists try to spiritualize all this is because they're trying to fit that uh, piece of the puzzle in, which obviously doesn't fit. Uh, as far as the word, uh, the word world doesn't mean China, the inhabited earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was trade with India going on at that time. There was trade with the Middle East. There was trade with the Gallic countries. There was trade with England. Uh, there was trade with North Africa, Libya, all those countries. None of those people saw any of these things. Even if you limited it to the Roman Empire, they did not see the promised resurrection of dead bodies. They did not see zombies wandering around their streets. They didn't see any of this, especially uh, the book of Revelation, those quotations. And you believe the book of Revelation was completely fulfilled uh, before the end of AD 70. None of those things happened. No, the every living thing in the ocean did not die. One third of mankind did not die. Uh, all of mankind, free and slave, was not hiding in caves. That is BS. It did not happen in 70 AD. And that's the reason you retreat to figurative language. You see it with the eye of faith. You sound like a Mormon. Uh for Thessalonians, it wasn't the pagans persecuting the Jews. Uh, excuse me, it says countrymen. Yes, Book of Acts says that the Jews originally were persecuting the Thessalonians. But when Paul wrote uh, First Thessalonians, he says, your fellow countrymen. That means Greek pagans, not a bunch of Jews. And nothing happened to those Greek pagans that were persecuting the Jews in Thessalonica. Nothing. As far as marriage, you still didn't explain why Greek Christians in Corinth can't get married because of what was happening to Jews in Jerusalem. You completely avoided that topic. Thank you very much. Um, and as far as Max King didn't lie in quoting vines, I showed photos of the actual page out of vines. Yes, Max King lied, as most preterists do. You can't maintain your position without lying and a whole bunch of hoopla. Uh, I'm, To be honest, I'm disgusted with preterism. 
I thought it was going to be a way to save the savior. And it's just a bunch of malarkey. It's hot air time. And I'm done. All right. Thank you, Mark, for that. 10 minutes to you, Don, and uh, unmuting you, muting Mark. Let me know when to hit the go. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, very good. <clears throat> All right. Outstanding. Let, let me do one more thing back here. Uh, let right me, back here. Yeah, you just let me know and I'll hit it. Okay. Okay. Let's do this. All right. Ready. Go ahead. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Mark goes back to the issue of over half of Paul's epistles were pagans. And he said, Preston's reference to the Old Testament is totally irrelevant. Preston's emphasis on God coming in the Old Testament and it being metaphoric language, apocalyptic language, all totally relevant. And he said, I'm not even going to address it. Well, no wonder. No wonder he doesn't want to address that. Here's the fact, folks. Paul said his gospel, the gospel that he preached in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Colossae, in Thessalonica. Guess where Paul got it? From the Old Testament. Guess where he preached it first? In the synagogues. And in Acts chapter 13, for instance, he preached uh, in the synagogue, uh, in, in, a, uh, in the synagogue of Pisidia first, and then Antioch, or in Antioch of Pisidia. And the Jews at first would not accept it, then the pagans did. Well, what were the pagans doing there? Because it's just simply a historical fact that many, many, many pagans attended the Jewish synagogues. There were several different layers of pagans. You had what I call, for lack of better terminology, street pagans. Those were the people who went to the, to the pagan temples of Aphrodite, Dionysius, etc., etc. There were also a massive number Josephus records it, Tacitus records it, of Gentiles who attended the Jewish synagogues. Now, there were two different classes of them. There were what they called the Sebelmai, the God-fearers. They were pagans. They were uncircumcised, but they attended the Jewish synagogue. They were Gentiles. And then there were the circumcised, in other words, <clears throat> pardon me, the proselytes. So guess what they learned when they attended the synagogue? They learned that Old Testament that Mark so bitterly resents Paul appealing to. Well, I'm sorry. It's Paul who is at stake here. And it's Paul who said, Acts chapter 26, 21. And now having obtained help from God, I stand before small and great. He stood before Gentiles. He stood before Greeks. He stood before Roman governors, and he says, I stand before small and great, preaching no other thing than what Moses and the prophets said should come, and that is that Christ would be the first to be raised from the dead and preach life and life to the Gentiles. So <clears throat> according to Mark, these pagan Gentiles had no interest in, no association with, Anything from the Old Testament, they would have thought, and he, and he tries to appeal uh, to uh, taking language literal at face value. Well, yeah, you take language at face value within its Zetzenleben, what the German scholars call the Zetzenleben. You take the language at face value within the cultural, social, religious milieu in which it was used. Mark wants to take Paul's use of Old Testament prophetic language, which he quotes time and time again when he's speaking to Gentile audiences, by the way. And Mark would go, Paul, Paul, you got to cut this out, dude. What are you preaching to these pagans for out of the Old Testament? They don't know that. They don't care anything about that. And Paul said, because they're supposed to know it, because their salvation, the salvation of Gentiles is dependent upon the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. Gentiles had no hope of salvation apart from divorce from the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made old covenant Israel. Luke, who was a Gentile, wrote the gospel and the book of Acts. What are they about? The restoration of Israel in Jesus Christ. Now, what, 
what is a Gentile doing writing about the fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies over and over and over in the book of Luke, over and over, even in the book of Acts, and especially even in the book of Acts, we have Luke appealing to these stories from the Old Testament and showing them to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the establishment of the church. Why is he doing this? According to Mark, that's totally irrelevant. He should have been doing it. He's out of line. Well, Luke didn't think he was out of line. Paul didn't think he was out of line. Paul was doing what he was doing because he knew no pagan had any hope of salvation unless and until God fulfilled his old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. That's found all throughout the book of Isaiah. It is absolutely undeniable. And therefore, when Mark says, well, all that Preston does is appeal to this apocalyptic Old Testament language. I'm not even going to address it. Well, Paul did. And Paul used it in writing to and debating with Gentiles. Where do you think he's got it? He got his doctrine of the judgment of the world standing on the Areopagus, Athens, Acts chapter 17. God's going to judge the world. He got that from Psalms 98. He got that from Isaiah 45. He got that from a host of Old Testament prophecies that were made to and about Old Covenant Israel. So it's totally, totally inappropriate. Mark's entire premise here of the division and dichotomy between pagans and Paul's use of the Old Testament, and therefore Preston's uh, totally out of line in appealing to those Old Testament apocalyptic passages, is totally false. Uh, has no merit whatsoever. Okay. And then he says, well, I ignored the ascension. No, I made a couple of different references to it, Mark. I guess you just simply missed that. I pointed out that all of these other passages that you apply to the same passage of Acts chapter 1, I told you they did not mean anything closely resembling what you claim they did. Now, let's take real quick note of what the angel said. This same Jesus whom you have seen taken up from you. Now, notice there's two things at, at stake here. He shall come in like manner. Well, that term in, translated in like manner is from the Greek term hon tropon. You told me I ought, to, I ought to learn the Greek. Well, I did. Thank you very much. Hon tropon doesn't mean in an act, exact, precise, physical likeness. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you to gather as, from the Greek term, hon tropon, a mother hen gathers her chicks. Now, was Jesus saying, uh, you know, I would just literally like to spread my arms and just gather Jerusalem right under my arms. How silly. Second Timothy chapter three, verse eight, uh, six to eight. Paul said, as home tropon, James and James, James Breeze <laughs> withstood Moses. So these evil men will do likewise. Well, was Paul saying that the evil men that he was talking about going to turn their staffs into snakes? Was he saying that they were going to turn water uh, into blood? No. It's a general likeness, if not precise likeness. Therefore, Mark's emphasis on a five foot five Jewish man ascending into heaven. And he said, I, I ignored that. Well, let's see. He completely ignored the fact that Jesus said, the kingdom does not come with observation, but the kingdom comes at the time of the parousia. Therefore, the parousia would be unseen. Not a word about it. He completely ignored the fact that Paul said, we're not looking at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. And he's talking about the resurrection. He completely ignored passage after passage after passage in which I adduced the invisible coming of the Lord. Well, let's look at Revelation chapter one, verse seven, because he said every eye has got to be every eye. Well, let's see. Behold, he comes with the clouds and every eye shall see him. Now watch this. This is what's known in the Greek as an apexegetical usage when he says, even those who pierced him. You want the explanation and the definition of every eye? It is even those who pierced him. It's taken directly out of Zechariah chapter 12, another one of those Old Testament prophecies that Mark says we ought to just totally ignore. But the New Testament writers didn't ignore them. They used them because they were anticipating the fulfillment of, of those old, old Testament prophecies. Okay. And then he says, well, my argument on Caiaphas is wrong because Caiaphas is the one that had been, that, that had been talking. That's not the point. 
He says he knows it's in the plural. Well, why not honor the fact that it's in the plural and say, no, it had to be Caiaphas personally. No, it didn't. He is speaking to the, to the Sanhedrin as a corporate body. And then he completely turns my words around in regard to the, to the temple. I, I took fact, note of the fact that it was the Western wall. I never said it was the temple that was still standing today. I said, it's the Western wall. And Jesus was speaking of the temple itself when he said, not one stone shall be left standing. So Mark takes my words and twists them around and misrepresents what I had to say. Now, I want you to notice, folks, he completely and totally ignored the Greek word apontesis and what it means Time. in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, thank you. Uh, either way, uh, we're moving into the next session here, which is going to be cross-examination, gentlemen. So Don's going to be the first one, kind of like the lawyer, who's going to be uh, asking questions to Mark, and Mark will be answering those not with a question but with answers as much as he can. Um, and then after the 10 minutes of that, we'll allow Mark to ask Don questions. And then we're going to be getting to five minute closings each. Get your questions in via super chat. I appreciate all the support so far. Hit the like button. I don't care what side you're on. Even if you disagree, if you want this information to make it out there, the algorithm notices this stuff. So if you want this to go far and wide, like the video, comment, share, etc. Okay. I'm going to get my timer here for 10 minutes. Don, let me know when you're ready. And Mark, give me a thumbs up or just let me know. So I'm asking questions here? Yes, sir. Okay. You're asking Mark. <clears throat> you ready? Uh, uh, Derek, one yes. question. I thought the 10 minutes was going to be broken up uh, between us. For 10 minutes, him and I would have an open discussion. Not that he gets 10 minutes and I get 10 minutes. Don, how do you want to do it? It's irrelevant to me. I don't care, Mark. What's your preference? I, I would prefer a 10 minute total, just back and forth question. Just back and forth? Okay. Okay. So 10 minutes total instead of 10 and 10. So just 10 total cross exam. Yeah. Discussion and cross examination. For 10 okay. minutes. Yeah. Just 10 minutes. Now, okay. I'll set the time. Uh, with, with the caveat that one man not dominate the entire discussion. Yes, I agree. Sounds good to me. Okay. I'll just butt in if I feel like that's happening. There you go. Cool. All right. Starting the timer now. Okay, Mark, I called attention to the fact that apontesis, the Greek word, and this is well attested. I don't know if you've ever studied it, so uh, I'm not going to take the time to document this from Josephus. Uh, it's documented in a host of uh, mm -hmm. both Roman, Greek. Uh, it's in the lexicons, et cetera, et cetera. Apontesis does not mean to come and take away. That's simply not its mean. It means a, a dignitary was going to come to visit, to stay, and the citizens of that city came out to meet them and escorted them back to the city and they dwelt there together. What is your justification for denying that application and saying that the text does in fact talk about a rapture and a removal of the church from the earth? Well, uh, taking the advice of the preterist J. Stuart Russell, I am merely letting the Bible speak for itself, taking Bible things in Bible words. Uh, the plain and obvious sense of that language if you were to ask 100 people on the street after telling them that, what does it mean? They would say Jesus was coming back to rapture people, to get people and bring them up into the sky. That's the plain and obvious language. You don't have to retreat to the intricacies of Greek to try to wiggle your way out of that. That's how most of Christianity interprets that. So that's my answer to that. It's, it's well, taking the words at their face value. You're not. Well, point of fact is I am taking the text on face value based upon the Greek. And the New Testament is simply the translation of the Greek that, that has been misunderstood. That's, that's simply undeniable. I don't care if you accept it or not. But the fact is, uh, from the Greek language, it is an absolute undeniable reality. Apontesis meant to come to be met and to be escorted back. It doesn't mean to remove. That's simply not the plain meaning. And you keep referring to, you know, J. Stuart Russell. That's all fine and good. I respect a lot that he did. J. Stuart Russell, by the way, acknowledged the highly metaphoric apocalyptic nature of the language that you deny. 
Oh, I've already dealt with this. Uh, my turn? I suppose so, yeah. Okay. Uh, to me, Acts chapter 1 and the Ascension story, it cannot get any clearer that as Jesus was visibly seen leaving, he would be visibly seen arriving back for a second coming. Whether he's got a body or not, I don't care. The bot, you're stuck on the body thing. It doesn't matter. However, he was coming back, he was going to be visibly seen. Don, I want you to tell me if the writer of Acts really, really meant that Jesus was going to be visibly seen at his second coming, how might he have phrased it? Because uh, I can't see how he could have gotten any more specific. Go ahead. You got to Okay. Well, I, th I think that's actually quite a legitimate question if that is what he was trying to convey. However, I've already pointed out that, that the Greek term hontropon does not indicate what you are claiming that it indicates. And when, when you look at that term hontropon, and it does, it never, hardly ever, hardly ever means specifically and explicitly the same, but rather in, in some vague generality. Now, you just said you don't care if he had a body or not. Well, that must mean you don't care if he's invisible or not, which means he could come back invisibly. Well, as a, as a point of fact out, I have already demonstrated. Now, let's, let's look at it like this. The coming of Acts chapter 1 is the coming of Matthew chapter 24, 29 through 34. But the coming of Matthew chapter 24, 29 to 34, would be the coming of Christ in the glory of the Father of Matthew uh, 16. Don, Don I, I love your answering, but you, you're not answering my question. I want you to pretend to be the author of Acts. And I want you to tell me how, if Jesus really was going to come back visibly, how would he have worded it? Now answer that question, please. Don't change the subject. Well, I didn't change the subject. I addressed you're not the subject. answering my question. Answer my question. No, I did answer it very clearly no, by showing okay. that in like manner doesn't mean what you are imposing on it. Then what would mean that? That's what I want you to answer. Pretend that you knew Jesus was coming back visibly. How would you have put it in writing to make that obvious? I don't know. I might choose any number of words that were available even uh, even in the Greek at that time, none of which are used in that text. And, I've, and as I said, I think it is a legitimate question. I've said that for years and years and years. My point of it is that when you compare Acts chapter 1 with all of these other passages, none of which can be taken literally, uh, it, it, it was kind of like uh, one author, very, very noted uh, Christian apologetics and Christian hermeneutic, uh, Milton Terry, 19th century. He said this, no matter what we may think of Acts chapter 1, since it is the same as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, and all of these other passages, all of which are placed in the first century unequivocally, then we cannot negate or take Acts chapter 1 and impose on it some literalistic application. Uh, Don, that that, that these again, other passages do not bear. You're not answering my question. I and, just did answer no, it. No, <laughs> I, I, I'm expecting an answer like, you will see Jesus with your own eyes. Visibly, he will be absolutely seen physically by eyeballs. That's the kind of answer you would use if he absolutely positively wanted to make it visible. The fact is, Acts chapter 1 doesn't just say they'll see Jesus. It talks about gazing. It talks about visually seeing. It goes into a dozen different ways to emphasize this will be visible. You, can't, you cannot make it any more visible than what Luke made it in the first chapter of Acts. And you are deliberately avoiding answering that because Acts chapter 1 pulls the rug out from under preterism. I don't know how uh, many more... I don't know how many more ways I can answer it than what I have. You didn't I, answer I, it. Go I am, on I, with your no, ask sure me a question. Ask me a question. If Luke wanted to convey the idea that the coming of Acts chapter one was of the same identical nature of the unseen coming of Christ of Matthew 24 on the clouds of heaven, clouds, Matthew 24, clouds, Acts chapter one, power and great glory. They will see him on the clouds. 
but it's an invisible coming because it's a coming in the glory of the father, like the father had come. It's as least, no, no, as no, 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 no. Don't interrupt me now. I didn't interrupt you. So oh, don't interrupt where, me. Where's the question? I'm getting to the question. Okay. Acts chapter one. How do you divorce Acts chapter one from the entire database of the nature of the coming of the Lord that is found in reference solidly from the Old Testament applied in the New Testament as a optically invisible event? That's a contradiction in terms. Optically no, invisible. Uh, that's balderdash. Now you've gotten into the the rickety part of preterism. Okay, let me follow, let me ask a question to follow up on that. When David said that God was seen riding on the clouds, coming out of heaven to deliver him from Saul, what, what? How could he have said words any different? Again, I don't care about the Old Testament. You can quote ah. the Old Testament all day long. I'm not going to waste my time. Well, was Paul wasting his time when he? used nothing but the Old Testament to prove the coming of the Lord, the judgment, the resurrection. Was Paul out of line? Uh, Paul, when speaking to the Greeks on uh, Mars Hill, was not using the Old Testament when he said, when he was talking about his God, the unknown God. There's no unknown God in the Old Testament. Paul was dealing with them on their level. When you say that Paul wasn't using the Old Testament, that, that's simply not true because he was drawing from Psalms 98, the Lord will judge the world. He was drawing on Isaiah 44 He was and 45. He was drawing on a host of Old Testament prophecies that specifically said the Lord will come and judge the world. And for oh. you to say, by, by the way, by the way, when you say that there was no unknown God, there was the Asherah, there was the partner of Astaroth. There was a variety and a host of gods that were not true gods. That's why he calls them unknown. They were unknown. Though there may be many that are called gods, yet there is but one God. That's the sense in which Paul was using that. So for you to ignore the Old Testament and say it's irrelevant, you're completely discounting the entire database of Paul's eschatology and theology. Because remember, as I've already proven, Paul said, and Luke taught the same thing, their doctrine, their entire eschatology, their entire gospel was nothing but the expectation of the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to the covenant of Israel. Time. And you can, you can scoff at it all you want. doesn't matter. Time. So that was the end of the 10. We're, so are we only doing 10 for cross-examine and then doing we're, we're doing our five-minute? Five-minute summation. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So... Mark, you're first on that. Five okay. minutes. Okay, me... and if you'll put my PowerPoint back up. Okay, and then I'm going to have Don do five, and then we're getting to Q&A. So if you have any questions, critiques, comments, whatever, uh, feel free to super chat those, and we will get to them shortly. All right, pulling up your – you said you wanted it up? Yeah. Okay. So let me know when, and I'll hit, uh, hit start. I'm going to mute you, Don. I'll just remember to unmute you when time right. starts. On your mark, get set, go. Gotcha. Does preterism fail? Preterism fails without contortions and distortions of words. Preterism fails without lies and intellectual dishonesty. Preterism fails as the universe didn't dissolve in their second coming. Preterism fails without con games and the gish gallops. Preterism fails as the gospel was not preached worldwide back then. Preterism fails as you don't need a PhD in the Old Testament theology to understand New Testament eschatology. Preterism fails to explain the halting of Greek weddings. Preterism fails to explain the lack of revenge on the pagans in Thessalonica. Preterism fails to explain the lack of new bodies on old Christians. Preterism fails to explain the lack of flying Christians. Preterism fails to explain how, if Christianity was removed from the earth in 70 AD, how was it still around a year later? Preterism fails as there was not a worldwide massacre back then. Preterism fails as Christian zombies never showed up. 
Preterism fails as ancient historians saw nothing of it in 70 AD. Preterism fails as all church fathers failed to notice anything. Preterism fails as temple stones are still one atop the other. Preterism fails as Caiaphas never saw the second coming promised him. So in answer to the where question of Preteris, where does the scripture say that Jesus' return must be visible? Here, Jesus shall come in like manner as ye have seen with your eyeballs him go. You can't get more specific than that. Anybody reading this verse with an open heart knows for a fact that Jesus was to come in the same manner they saw him go. How did they see him go? Visibly. So without a doubt, it's obvious. Preterism fails. Preterism fails to explain away the false prophecies of Jesus and company. For more information on this and the second coming, I have a book available, Broken Promises, Jesus and the Second Coming. Just search Amazon for Broken Promises, Jesus, and it will pop right up. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate that. Two minutes uh, you had left. Cool. Don? Oh, you're muted, Don. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Put those charts back up there, his initial charts. His a what? Those charts that you just put up. You talking about this? No, the previous ones. You know, go back. The, what were they, 19 reasons or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now go back. Yeah, there Are you, you go. To, you want to respond to all of those? I do. Okay, so let me know Absolutely. when you want to start. Let's go. Ready, set, go. Preterism does not fail because it does not distort the meaning of words. For instance, apontesis, it is Mark Smith that has contorted and distorted the meaning of apontesis. He makes it coming and removing, but it doesn't mean that. Preterism works and does not fail because it doesn't lie, because it uses the word stoichia in precisely one of the ways that Vine's dictionary says that it was supposed to be used. Max King didn't lie. Preterism does not fail because Peter did not predict the dissolution of the universe because he used the word stoichia, which Paul, and he said he was using it just like Paul was using it, but Paul used it to talk about the basic elements of the Jewish doctrine, not the material universe. Preterism works. Preterism uh, is successful because the gospel was preached to the known world in the first century. Uh, you know, Mark talked about these far-flung places. Those were not in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the known civilized world under the ubric of oikumene. Preterism, no, you don't need a PhD to understand preterism, to accept it, and to love it, and you don't need a PhD in the Old Testament. However, you do have to honor what Paul, Peter, James, Every one of the New Testament writers said that is their doctrine. Folks, if you don't get anything else out of this, just remember, Mark Smith said the Old Testament is totally irrelevant to the meaning of the New Testament eschatology, to the doctrine of the coming of the Lord. Paul didn't believe that. Paul said his doctrine of the resurrection was from Moses, the law and the prophets, and nowhere else. Thus, when Mark Smith on this debate said, I'm not going to deal with the Old Testament. Well, number one, I don't blame him because it totally destroys his skepticism. But secondly, he's simply denying the emphatic, specific, explicit words of the New Testament writers that their eschatology was nothing. But the expectation of the imminent fulfillment of the Old Testament promises made to Old Covenant Israel. Number seven, preterism fails, he said, because you have to explain the halting of Greek weddings. Well, number one, Paul did not forbid weddings. He just simply said it's best for the because of the present distress. And I demonstrated there was distress throughout the Roman Empire at the time this was going on. Thousands upon thousands of Jews, turmoil in city after city after city. By the way, 
there was a massive, massive famine taking place in the Corinthian area at the time Paul wrote. There's part of your present distress. Number eight, <clears throat> he says preterism fails, so uh, the lack of revenge on pagans. Well, he actually admitted, yeah, Jews did participate. Well, the Jews were the movers and the shakers, the instigators of the persecution. That's who Paul is talking about when he said it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who are troubling you. And I asked the question, I don't think Mark ever answered it, were the Jews who lived in Thessalonica, who attended the synagogue, were they the fellow citizens, fellow countrymen of the church members? Never answered that. Well, preterism works because the Bible did, never promised new physical bodies for old Christian bodies. Next chart, next page. Number 10, he says preterism fails to, lack, uh, to explain the lack of flying Christians. That's because we don't have to explain that because the Bible never predicted the flying of Christians off of earth. That is a completely false claim. Number 11, preterism fails to explain how if Christianity was removed from the earth, uh, how it's still around a year later. Well, again, false premise. God didn't remove Christianity from the earth. Preterism works because the great tribulation did take place in the first century. Uh, let me just go on. Preterism fails uh, because all church fathers fail to notice anything. Well, Athanasius said Christ had conquered death. Chrysostom talked about this coming of Christ. These men knew. Now, were they still futures? Yes. Did they know that Christ had come? Eusebius said Christ came in flaming fire in AD 70. And I'll just go down. Number 16, he misrepresented me again. Jesus was not talking about the temple stones, or he was talking about the temple stones when he said not one stone. The only thing standing today is the West wall, the retaining wall, is not one to talk about the temple walls itself at all. Preterism works on every single level. There is nothing about preterism that fails. And as a result of it, we can have faith in Jesus Christ as the son of God. Time. We can have faith that God exists and the Bible is his word. And thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate your closing statements. We'll go to Q and A now. I'll try and make it quick because I know Don's an early bird. He he, goes, he probably goes to sleep. What time early. is it? Oh my goodness! I'm seven minutes from bedtime here. <laughs> Stephen Beanie, thank you for becoming a member of Myth Visions YouTube channel. Uh, Lazarus Conley said, uh, "Hope Resurrected Podcast says for both under the agreed upon presup." With time text, there's no Jewish, Christian, pagan, secular source that says Christ returned in the first century. Why? Who's he asking that of? I, I'm assuming that's for both. asked of me. Well, it says both for both of you to answer why. Okay. Well, first of all, our records of the early church, and, and this has been a, a, a question of perplexity. I mean, anybody familiar with the early church writings has to admit that the question of why didn't they mention it is, in, in fact, uh, perplexing. I'd make a couple of really, really quick points. Point number one, the shepherd of Hermas and other uh, apostolic and immediate patristics were perplexed because, number one, they expected a literal physical coming at the fall of Jerusalem. It did not happen. Therefore, something was wrong. Richard Balcom says, when the Lord did not come in AD 70, as promised, there was, quote, a crisis of faith in the first century church. Secondly, they did, rec thirdly, they did recognize that something massive had happened. As I mentioned just in, in my close, Eusebius said the Lord came in flaming fire by means of the Romans in the destruction of Jerusalem. Final point, and I'll hush here. We are told Many different scholars take note of this. Uh, I believe John Wenham, uh, John Wenham is one of them in, in his book, uh, Rethinking Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He points out that in the persecution of the church by Decius, the Roman emperor Decius, there was a systematic destruction of Christian records, particularly Bible documents, as well as many other documents, and that had actually taken place before. We do not have all of the early church records, and to think that we do is rather naive. Thank you. Mark, did you want to make a quick uh, comment on your answer on that? 
you're muted. Hold on, let me unmute you. Okay. Oops. You're mute. Yeah, there hello, you go. Hello, hello? Yep. Okay. Uh, the reason nobody noticed any of this stuff is because it never happened. As I pointed out, not a single historian from back then mentioned anything about zombie invasions or Judgment Day or all the fish dying in the sea or people hiding in caves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, everything in the Bible that was supposed to happen, Don has basically turned into figurative goo and uh, wishful thinking made it go away. Uh, the fact is nothing happened. Nothing. Go thank on. You, thank you. All right, Walker, thank you for the super sticker. I didn't see a comment or question scrolling down. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, Humanist Reformation, thank you for that super chat. Every man was never repaid according to their deeds, Matthew 16, 27. And the trumpet never sounded all the tribes of the earth, never mourned the coming of the Son of Man, Matthew 24, 30 through 31. Full partial preterism fails. Would you like to respond to that, Don, since that's obviously... Yeah, pretty obvious, pretty obvious. Well, first of all, this individual is acknowledging the time statement, so that's good. Secondly, you have to understand what Jesus is saying in Matthew 16. Was he talking about a literal globe? That's imposing a modern cosmology on the situation. Number three, he is taking the trumpet literally. Well, I've already shown from the Old Testament that God came with the sound of the trumpet, with the shout, with the angels in flaming fire many, many times in the Old Testament. And the language, for instance, of Matthew chapter 24, 29 to 31, where it talks about Christ coming with the angels on the clouds, with a shout and with the trumpet, is taken directly out of that Old Testament matrix of apocalyptic language. And when it says all the tribes of the earth, well, that's from the Greek word gi, which is better translated as land. In fact, many scholars believe it should be translated as land in the great majority of places, that likewise is that statement, all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, taken directly from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, which is a specific prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Thank you so was much. Fulfilled. Humanist Reformations again. Thank you for that wonderful, uh, generous uh, wow. super chat. Keep up the good work, Myth Vision. People are actually picking up the Bibles and seeing the failed prophecies. Jesus gave just like one can verify in other failed cults and religions. Special pleading is not working for Christianity as well as other failed religions. I think what I, I want to allow Don to be able to respond if he wants to. Maybe Mark wants to comment on this one. Don't know. Just trying to flip floppy here. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to respond to that. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, the person asking the question is absolutely correct. Uh, religion makes a whole bunch of promises. Uh, and when they don't turn out, uh, they allegorize and figuratize and contort and distort and put the words through a meat grinder uh, to try to wiggle out of these things. Uh, when Jesus makes specific promises and then they don't turn out, that's the time to walk. You don't have to learn Hebrew and Greek and spend 10 years wasting your time. Uh, take the words at face value. Take them as his hearers would have taken them. They weren't scholars. They were shepherds and people like that, fishermen. Uh, Jesus made a bunch of promises. They turned out false. I mean, draw your own conclusions. Okay, Don? Yes, I would agree with one thing Mark said. How about that? <laughs> he said, understand these words in the way Jesus's listeners would have heard them. Well, amen and hallelujah. His listeners, by and large, when Jesus was on earth, were Jews who went to the synagogue every single Sabbath. They were at the temple every feast day. What were they hearing at the synagogues and in the temple? They were hearing the Tanakh, the Old Testament taught. They were hearing this language of God coming on the clouds, coming with a shout, ne never, ever, ever taken literally. They did not believe in that physical kind of coming. Mark says, oh, we got to take it literally today, which means, according to Mark, we, we have to ignore the original Hebrew context, the original Hebraic political, social, religious milieu and context, the Zetz in Lebanon, 
And we have to ignore that same thing when the New Testament writers are quoting from that Old Testament apocalyptic language. So uh, when humanist Ref reformation says, oh, this is all great, uh, people picking up their Bibles. Well, Mark says we shouldn't even bother picking up our Bibles. I mean, after all, it's nothing but a bunch of lies. But I've already demonstrated, number, number one, his hermeneutic is completely, totally false. When you divorce yourself in reading the New Testament, when you divorce yourself from the old, your eschatology, your ideology, your theology, your skepticism completely fails. Thank you, Don. Lazarus Conley, Hope Resurrected Podcast. Thank you for the super chat for both. Preston says Jesus saved, elected all Israel plus Gentiles in 70. So how's first Peter of the elect today? If everyone was elected in 70 Romans 11, 25 through 27. I'm not, I'm not clear on. So how's what is that supposed to be first Peter? I, I, I figured Peter, but it could be something else. It doesn't make sense. How's first. No. <laughs> what would you think it would be? What do you think, Mark? What do you think that means? Uh, I use PT for point. First so point of the elect today. I, I'm, well, I think I think knowing Lazarus Conley um, like I do, I, I know what he's trying to get at. He's trying to say if Preston is right, and if all Israel was saved in AD seventy, uh, and if the Gentiles uh, fullness of the Gentiles came in, he he. And by the way, he takes that numerically, which is an error. But nonetheless, he's saying, well, if that was finished in AD seventy, then there's no salvation for anyone today. Well, that's absolutely false. Isaiah chapter 66 says that after the day of the Lord. Now, he takes that just like Mark takes that an earth burning time ending event, which is never predicted in the Bible. But Isaiah chapter 66 talks about after the day of the Lord, the survivors would go to the nations of the world who had never heard the word of the Lord ever. And would call them to serve the God of Israel. Likewise, Revelation 21 and 22, after the end of the millennium, after the coming of the Lord, the judgment, the resurrection, what do we find? Well, you have a new Jerusalem coming down from God. It's not the removal of the church from the earth, as Mark has been insisting. This is God coming down to dwell with man in full conformity with apontesis. What do we find? New Jerusalem. And the gates of that city are always open. For what? for the nations to come in and find healing. Folks, that's evangelism. That's evangelism after the so-called end. And thus the entire premise of the question by Mr. Conley is completely misguided. Thank you. Did you want to comment on that or could we want to move on? Uh, I want to comment on one thing that Don mentioned. Okay. Uh, the book of Revelation mentioning the New Jerusalem coming down and Paul mentioned the Christians are going up. That is a contradiction. Uh, one advantage of being an atheist and an ex-Christian is I don't have to worry about contradictions. Uh, but go on. Thank you. Thank Paul, you. Paul never said they were going up. You're misusing apontesis. You need to look at the Greek of apontesis. Thank you, gentlemen. Humanist Reformation. It's never to be taken literally when prophecy fails, unless it's in a religion that you don't follow. Then that religion is just wrong. <laughs> Ever hear of special pleading? <laughs> I think that was literally what you guys were just having happen just now. <laughs> Thank you, I, don't, I don't think that's even worth commenting, to be honest about it. Uh, uh, I, 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 I will a... comment on it be, because I have already demonstrated, you know, when people will not accept the evidence that is laying there on page after page after page after page of the Old Testament that defines the nature of the language of the day of the Lord. And they just they, they ignore it, say it's irrelevant when it's not irrelevant. When, as I have proven repeatedly, the New Testament writers use that very language. It is the foundation of their ideology, their theology and their eschatology. And when, and so when Mark and Mr. Humanist Reformation, when, when these individuals say, I'm not going to pay attention to the Old Testament. I'm just going to read it like just like I pick up a newspaper. He never said that, but that's really what he means. Uh, that's the wrong. That's the wrong hermeneutic. If you pick up Shakespeare today, you don't take you don't read him in the context of 21st century America. You read him in the context of what century was he? He was 17th or 18th century Britain. I'm not good on Shakespeare at all, but you get the point. You don't read you don't read him in the context 
of a totally different cosmology, a totally different social structure and setting, a totally different religious context. You read it in the context in which it was given. Thank you. Thank you. Humanist Reformation says, don't fear those that can't get their words right, whether it's David Koresh, Joseph Smith, Muhammad, Jesus, or anyone else. Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, or just use common sense. Amen and hallelujah. And I have shown the proper use of that language. Okay. And my comment is the reason I put several slides in about how preterists put words through the meat grinder is because everybody's seeing that going on tonight. Uh, you cannot take the Bible at face value in its plain and obvious sense as the preterist writer uh, pleaded for and be a preterist. You have to put these things through a meat grinder, but go on. Thank you. Thank you. Dustin Ellerby says, thank you, Derek, for hosting <clears throat> and thanks to the guest as well. Thank you very well, thank much. You. I'm scrolling down here. Let's uh, see what we have. Oh, we got 21st Century Mind in the house. Thank you so much. I uh, did not see a question from you yet. Oh, here you are. 21st Century Mind, Dr. Preston, can you please share how full preterism relates to Israel-only doctrine, and will you ever debate Israel-only? The full preterist view utterly destroys the Israel-only doctrine. I have several, several articles on my website that completely and totally refute it. I have refused to debate uh, an Israel only advocate because I'll be very blunt here. I don't mean to be too harsh, but it's just simply the fact I have never met an honest Israel only advocate. I do not like to deal with dishonest people. And when I catch them in blatant outright lies, I'm not going to debate them. I won't give them the time of day. Uh, Thank you, Don. Can I, can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, I've gone through probably more than a dozen Predris books by various Predris authors. And I want to compliment Don. Don is the only Predris author I have gone through that didn't lie, distort, play the three, con three uh, shell game, etc., etc. So, Don, thank you for your honesty and keep it up. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that very much. And by the way, I've enjoyed this tremendously. There has been a very lively exchange. Uh, you know, nobody got angry. Nobody got mad. Nobody got out of line. That's the kind of discussions that are very, very profitable. We're obviously on different ends of the spectrum, but that's okay. We can discuss these things as gentlemen. And my, my Christian wife, my fundamentalist Christian wife, doesn't know who to support between the two of us. <laughs> Go, go, Mrs. Smith. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Lazarus Conley, thank you for the super chat again. And no source says the dead raised in first century. Why? Oh, good question. Because Mr. Conley, once again, is basing his entire question upon the same kind of premise that Mark Smith does, that the Bible is talking about the raising of literal physical bodies out of the dirt. That is not the point. The resurrection that was promised was the resurrection of, from the Adamic death. What is the Adamic death? The Adamic death was Adam and Eve in a garden. God said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because in the day, in the day you eat, you will surely die. He didn't say you become mortal. He didn't say you begin to die. And by the way, I have consulted, I have a friend in Israel who is a world-class Hebrew scholar. I, don't, I can't tell Hebrew scratching from hand scratching, but he says the point and the power of the Hebrew in that text is the day you eat, you're going to die. Not later, the day you eat. Now, I think everyone, I think all three of us would agree, Adam and Eve didn't die physically that day. So my argument is very, very simple. The resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be to overcome the Adamic death, as in Adam all men die, even so in Christ shall all, be, all men be made alive. So the death, uh, the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be the deliverance from the death of Adam. But the death of Adam was I, it was fellow, fellowship, death, spiritual death, alienation from God. It was not physical death. Therefore, the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would not be resurrection of biological, physical bodies out of the dirt. Okay. Uh, can you uh, put my uh, slides back up for a second? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I just want to remind everybody of what the what this one preterist wrote. Torture has been applied to these words to extort from them some other meaning than their obvious and natural one. Non preterist theologians won't accept the words of Jesus in their plain and obvious sense. Okay, uh, put me back up. I, I think we keep seeing this over and over and over. Uh, you can't just take the New Testament at face value, the words in their plain and obvious sense. Uh, preterism literally has to put these words through a meat grinder. I'm Thank done. you. Okay, point number one, point number one, that doesn't touch anything that I just pointed out from the text of the Bible itself. Number two, it is imposing. You, you say putting words to the meat grinder. No, it's taking the words in their original context in their original definition. It's not imposing 20th and 21st century definitions on them. It is absolutely a false hermeneutic. Pick up the Bible and say, I'm going to read this in the same way I'm going to read the, the local newspaper. That's that's the wrong hermeneutic. Thank you, Don. Uh, crazy even Ivan. Mark, how might a reader determine a passage of scripture is not to be understood concretely, materially, or spatially, but metaphorically? That would uh, depend on the context. Obviously, words are used sometimes metaphorically. Uh, but like, like I said earlier, if you were to take a lot of these passages and just do the J old Jay Leno thing uh, where he walks up the people on the street and tells them something, it gets a reaction. The average person would interpret most of these second coming passages in the plain and obvious sense, which J. Stuart Russell pleaded for. They, I mean, forget the book Revelation. Uh, John was high on drugs when he wrote it, whatever. But the rest of the stuff in the New Testament is, is fairly obvious. Uh, Paul wasn't being metaphorical or allegorical when he talks about going up in the air to meet Jesus. Uh, there, there's nothing figurative in a lot of those passages. And the only reason the preterists force them to be figurative is because it goes against their doctrine. So to respond to that, Mark keeps saying, well, if you walked up to any man on the street and asked him what this language uh, might mean, uh, we got a pretty good idea of what they might mean. They'd take it literally. Well, the problem with that is the average man on the street was not raised in that Hebraic culture uh, in that sets in Lebanon uh, and, and the religious context of understanding the metaphoric nature of the language. Now, let me give you a really, really prime example that I didn't have time to develop. In Isaiah 34, Isaiah said, the constellations of the sky are going to melt. The mountains shall be melted. The earth shall be utterly destroyed. It shall be folded up like a garment and it shall be destroyed. The dust of the earth shall be turned uh, into pitch. The streams shall be turned into pitch and it shall burn day and night forever and forever. Wow. That's not like the end of the world. Well, the trouble of it is in Isaiah chapter 34, eight and following, it's a prediction of the destruction of Edom and the capital city of Basra. Now, Malachi Chapter one, written over 230 years later, uh, later, probably a little bit more than that. Malachi looks back on the destruction of Edom as an accomplished fact. Did, did Malachi even have a clue in the world that the earth had been completely burned up, that, that there were fires in the streams and the dust of that area of Petra and Basra that were burning day and night and forever and ever and ever and ever? Uh, did he believe that the constellations of the sky had completely dissolved the sun, the moon, the stars? I think we're on safe ground by saying no. He didn't believe any of that. That's that's the religious, cultural, and literary milieu in which the first century Jews were raised. So for Mark to say, well, let's just walk out on the street and let's ask any reader of the New Testament, what they think this means. The average person on the street today probably couldn't name the books of the Old Testament, much less tell you about the destruction of Edom at the hands of the Babylonians in 583 BC.
Thank you, Don. Appreciate that. 21st mine. Don, will you ever debate Israel-only doctrine? I don't like to say never because I don't know what might come in the future. If I if I were to encounter an actual honest uh, Iowa, I, I'm, I'm not going to say I will, but I'm not going to say definitively no. You know, I, it's, it's an absolutely abhorrent doctrine, I will say that, has no merit whatsoever. And like I said, on my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, I have numerous articles on there. Just go to the uh, search bar, type in Israel only. You'll get a whole page of listings of the articles that I have written on the subject. Thank you, Don. Deep Drinks, thank you for the super chat. Regarding Jesus' return, it's wild to me that someone can translate the Bible to say the exact opposite of what it says in simple reading. Could we do the same for the resurrection, exodus, miracles? Uh, I'd like to say something on that. If, if the plain reading of the text can be completely turned topsy-turvy on its head, put through the meat grinder, I'm talking to the Christians now. What makes you think when you get to heaven that Bible gods are not going to do the same thing? Oh, heaven? Well, that was metaphorical. You're actually going to end up uh, living on a moon on Jupiter. Oh, you thought you would have eternal life? No, no, no. That was just figurative language. I mean, you can go on and on. How do you trust a person that promises to pay you back your $5? And then a week later, when it's time to get paid back, he's like, oh, I, that was figurative. I wasn't literally going to pay you back. Uh, you can't trust anything in the Bible if you're allowed to interpret it willy-nilly however you want. I agree with that last statement 100%. That's why the issue of hermeneutic is so critically important. And the issue of hermeneutic is what Mark Smith is ignoring. Mark Smith says, I'm not going to talk about the Old Testament. It's totally irrelevant to my position. I've already demonstrated over and over whether or not he wants to accept it is up to him. But I've already demonstrated Paul's eschatology from the Old Testament. Peter's eschatology, as he looked for the new heaven and new earth, the new creation, the restor restoration of all things, Peter said that he was anticipating those things in fulfillment of Moses, Samuel, yea, all of the prophets who have ever written. Where did Peter get his doctrine of the regeneration of the new creation, etc.? Got it from the Old Testament. He didn't pick up a newspaper one day and find this new concept, this new idea, this new eschatology. That is completely false. There is no merit whatsoever to Mark Smith, with all due respect, Mark. There is absolutely no justification for Mark saying, I'm not, I'm not going to pay a bit of attention to that Old Testament language. The entire New Testament eschatology is based on that Old Testament eschatology. So, therefore... When we go to that Old Testament and we see one example after another, this gets to the deep drinks question. When we see example after example after example of, quote, God coming on the clouds with the angels in flaming fire, with a shout, with a trumpet, destroying heaven and earth. And we can see that that language was used in conjunction with the destruction of, for instance, Babylon, Isaiah 13 of Egypt, Isaiah 19, of Israel, Isaiah chapter 24, of Edom in Isaiah 34, on and on and on it goes. When we can see all of those things and realize they were all past, just like Isaiah 64 said, verse one, I quoted it, Mark ignored it. Oh, that you would come down and rend the heavens, that you would come and shake the earth, that the nations might tremble at your presence. Lord, when you came down, the nations trembled at your presence. The mountains shook at your presence. None of that was literal. Mark never touched it. He just said it was irrelevant. No, it's not irrelevant because Isaiah 64 is a prayer for the second coming of Christ. Now, if, if Isaiah was praying for the second coming of Christ, which is Acts chapter 1, and he was praying for that coming to be like God had come in the Old Testament, which is never literal, never physical, never bodily, then guess what? We are on horribly bad ground. We are abusing hermeneutic to change the definition of that coming language to make it apply to something literal and visible. Okay, uh, Derek? 
Can I have a sh screen share again? Yeah, make it brief. We do have to try and we'll get do. through. And the wife texts me letting me know lasagna is ready. So. <laughs> okay. okay, back to the ascension. Beheld, that's with the eyeballs. A cloud, that's something you see. Receive him out of their sight. You see, you do sighting with your eyeballs. Looked, that's with the eyeballs. They, the direction they were looking, it was up. Behold, do you behold with your eyeballs? They beheld and saw they were wearing a white apparel. Gazing. Again, that's with the eyeballs. This same Jesus, which is taken up from heaven, from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go. Okay, you can uh, disconnect there. If if preterists are allowed to totally botch and mutilate and tear up plain language, it there's no limits to it. Seriously, uh, they're, if their if their God gets them up in heaven and they say, "Oh, sorry, everything was figurative," you're actually going to end up in hell. They got no reason to complain. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Imnag, thank you for the super sticker. Appreciate that, my friend. Scrolling down here. Um, sorry, there's so much commenting here. Everybody's just okay. Here we go. Imnag says, My biggest question is why is it too why is it so hard to pin actual history to Jesus? If there was absolute evidence other than the Bible, we wouldn't be having these debates. Mark Amen. You you, is that your comment then? <laughs> That's my comment. Okay. Well, the point of fact is there is a whole lot of bias behind that statement that is essentially arguing. Well, we can't take the Bible as valid because after all, uh, it was written by friends. It was written by disciples. Well, that's one of the most illogical kind of arguments that could possibly be made. I could turn that around and say, you know what? I, I don't have to accept, I shouldn't accept, as a matter of fact, anything that Mark Smith says, because after all, he's an enemy of the Bible. Since he's an enemy of the Bible, he's biased, he's prejudiced, he's not trustworthy. So to say, oh, well, we don't have any evidence other than the Bible. Well, guess what? The Bible is amazing. First John chapter one, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have touched, which we, which we have handled with our own hands, the word of God, Luke chapter one, Acts chapter one, uh, you know, especially Acts chapter one, the former treatise have made O Theophilus of all of the things that Jesus began to do and to teach from the time in which he was taken up. Okay, here is Luke. Well, who is Luke? He is a physician. He is a trained scholar. What did he say in Luke chapter one? Whereas many have taken in hand to record the things that are most assuredly believed in us, men who are eyewitnesses of his glory. And having myself had knowledge of these things from the very beginning, I decided to investigate, Luke says, so that I might present an orderly presentation of the things that are most assuredly believed by us. So here is a trained scholar who says that he interviewed Eyewitnesses, even though he knew of these things himself from the very beginning of their happening. The idea and the claim, by the way, that the New Testament books were written in at the end of the first century or end of the second. I'm sorry, that's totally untenable. Absolutely false. That won't stand up to critical examination whatsoever. I know what the critical scholars say on it won't stand up in any way, shape, form or fashion. Well, here is Luke. Peter said, Acts chapter 2, speaking of the resurrection, he had the 11 apostles, other apostles gather around him. And he says, God has raised him up whereof we are witnesses. You know, it's kind of funny about that. The very people that put Jesus to death were there that day. They had hated Jesus. And oh, by the way, Peter three times had rejected Jesus, turned his back on him forsaken him. I do not know the man. 
Yet now he's standing in front of that audience saying, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But God has raised him up and we're witnesses of that. What transformed Peter? By the way, what transformed James, Jesus' half-brother, and the rest of his brothers and the rest of his family? Who Mark 3, uh, verse 7, John chapter 7, verses 1 and following says, they all thought Jesus was crazy. They didn't believe on him until he was raised from the dead. This is the kind of testimony that we've got. We have James. Oh, we've got John the baptizer. Behold the Lamb of God. We've got, so we've got James. We got Peter. We got Paul who persecuted the name of Christ said, I thought I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus in Nazareth. Guess what? He met Jesus and he became the most famous apostle in all the world proclaiming the name of Jesus. And he said, have not I seen the Lord? Don, we got to wrap this one up. I know, I know. <laughs> no, you're, you're on a roll, man. You're, I'm you're on a roll, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. I just... Um, I, I feel a collection plate's going to come pretty soon. If you <laughs> well, go, ahead, go ahead and send some of this money well, in that's coming right in now. for Derek, you know. This is the collection plate right now. Uh, all right, Humanist Reformation, thank you so much for the super chat. I read the Old Testament and see Jesus failed to fulfill the Old Testament and what the Messiah was to fulfill. He fulfilled every word of it. You guys are in staunch disagreement on that? Yep. <laughs> Steve uh, Mag Magoy, forgive me if I butcher it, Magua, uh, ask the pastor. Thank you for the super uh, chat. I really appreciate it. I didn't see if you had a comment or something there, Steve, but I really do appreciate the support. And um, we have uh, one right here. 21st Century Mind says, Don, what is your opinion on Eastern Orthodoxy? Then after that, we got one more, and then we'll wrap things okay. up, gentlemen. Well, I think East Eastern Orthodoxy is an absolutely fascinating religion. I do not agree with its ceremonial sacral, uh, sacramentalism. I will tell you this. I have personally been in contact with several priests from the Eastern Orthodox Church who are full preterists and who tell me there is a long history of preterism in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don, for answering. David Hepworth, thank you for the super chat. Before deconverting, preterism was the only idea that made sense to me because of the New Testament's failed prophecies, but it also failed to address my doubts. Uh, I'd like to handle that one. Sure. And can you put my uh, slides back up? Sure. Many years ago, while I was happily sailing along as a Christian, on my unsinkable ship of faith, I started an in-depth study of the second coming, something I'd always wanted to do. I wasn't planning on leaving Christianity, but after extensive study, the evidence became overwhelming that Jesus had been a false prophet, and my unsinkable ship of faith was now sinking. But off in the distance was hope. I spotted the lifeboat of preterism. It promised a way to save the Savior by explaining away all those nasty false prophecies of Jesus, which had sunk my faith. I happily climbed in, feeling safe and secure. But then I made the mistake of asking questions, thinking, and examining this lifeboat. And what I found was this lifeboat was no more watertight than the Titanic I had just left. The lies and deceptions it took to keep it afloat just weren't worth it. And I had to finally admit to myself that, yes, Jesus had been a false prophet, and there was just no getting around it. I wasn't about to lie to myself and pretend everything was all right. Okay, done. Thank you. Thank you. It's like you had that one in the bag waiting to pull it out this whole time. <laughs> I, I did. Preterism to me, I was a Christian when I ran into preterism. And it, to me, offered hope. But the more I looked into it, the more I experienced personally the lying, the cheating, the dishonesty of the preterists uh, and the stupidity of the doctrines. Uh, that lifeboat sank. It, it really, it, it's a false hope. It really is. But just keep in mind. I want to give you, Don, the final word. This is the last words coming from you, Don, and then we're going to wrap things up. Okay. okay. Keep in mind what we've seen tonight, folks. We have seen Mark Smith unequivocally and emphatically say he divorces the Old Testament from the New Testament, eschatologically. 
I just heard him say and talk about he did an in-depth uh, examination of preterism, or I should say the second coming. Unfortunately, he approached that study from that very perspective of the churches of Christ. I was raised in the church of Christ, fifth generation member. I ran into the same issue of the time statements of the second coming of Christ coming in the first century. But you know what? I did my homework. I went to the Old Testament that the New Testament writers were quoting in their predictions of the second coming. And I realized this was metaphoric language. And so where I found myself running into the problems and look, I had some of my professors in seminary going, folks, we got a problem here. Paul said the Lord was coming back in the first century. He didn't do it. I don't know how to explain that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of the problems, of the doubts that studying and asking questions can, can rise. I also understand the fallacy of Mark Smith's hermeneutic of divorcing the New Testament from the old. No matter what else he says, you know, every single argument that he's made, ladies and gentlemen, ought to be reexamined, ought to be put under the prism and the microscope of that singular fact of him divorcing the New Testament eschatology from the old. When he does that, he is in denial of Paul's eschatology. He is in denial of James's eschatology. He is, in, he is denying Peter's eschatology. He is denying the eschatology of Revelation. He is denying the entire source of New Testament eschatology because he has this mistaken concept that the coming of the Lord was to be Jesus Christ as a five foot five Jewish man riding on a literal, visible, or physical cumulus cloud out of heaven to destroy heaven and earth, none of which was ever predicted. Full preterism is the only answer to what I call the challenge of Christ. Jesus said, if I do not do the works which my father has given me, do not believe me. Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me for my works. I take that very seriously. I accepted the challenge. Unlike Mark, my faith is stronger than it has ever been in my life because I know without a shadow of a doubt, Christ came. He gave us eternal life. And the Bible is truly his word. I'll close at that. Don, I, don't have, I don't have lasagna waiting for me. I, I, not only that, she's 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 writing me all sorts of promises here. So, listen, I got. Well, maybe we story. better not ask what kind of promises. Listen, I, 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 we better not have any broken promises. That's right. Eric, hey, Eric Romeo did have one super chat that, that he snuck in at the last second. Eric, I'm getting on to you later. Revelation seven three through four says the only. Only the 144,000 were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Does Don believe he was sealed with the Holy Spirit? That is not an exclusive sealing because the Holy Spirit was given to Gentiles as well as to Jews. And the 144,000 are simply the specific focus uh, of Revelation 7 and Revelation chapter 14. And that sealing was a miraculous sealing. And no, I do not have the miraculous sealing of the Holy Spirit today. Thank you so much for answering okay. that. Gentlemen, your um, websites, I got to add them to the description of this video so people watching it later. Feel I free did. to drop a comment in the comment section if you want. People can find your YouTube channel. I know that you have one, Don. Mark, I don't know if you do, but thank you no, so YouTube. much. Yeah, any final words from you, gentlemen? I just simply say again, Mark, thank you so much. I've been thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I have enjoyed this also, and thank you both. Thank you. And thank you very much, Derek. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for making it happen. Never forget, everybody. Amen. We are Myth Vision. <laughs> Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more.